All righty. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the OKS Trapper podcast. Today's episode is a little different in that I am going to be skipping my sponsor intros and diving right into the meat and potatoes. That's because my guest today is on here to talk not only about trapping, but to talk about a very special cause that is going on in a fundraiser for this upcoming weekend. I'll let him give all the details, but by way of introduction, my guest is a coyote catching machine who has blended his trap line prowess with his business acumen to launch an in-person course that he offers that I can't wait to attend one day called Coyote U. Mr. Mark Zagger, welcome to the show. Man, thanks a lot. That was a great intro. I, that was recorded, right? I can use that again? I hope so. Uh, you know, <laughs> I put great. a little bit of time and effort in those, so hopefully it'll be something <laughs> you can take and, you know, use again. But, you know, for everybody listening, my normal question's all about your trapping history, and I promise we're going to get there. But I'm going to skip that initial question and ask right now to bring everybody's attention to something that I know is very important to you. And it has to do with the flat iron, which I know not everybody will be familiar with, but I'll ask you for the history around it. And give us a little detail about what you have cooking for this upcoming weekend and who you're trying to raise some money for. No, that's great. I appreciate that. So, you know, if you've trapped for any length of time, you've probably been to a convention or two and, and conventions are a great place to, you know, get together and buy goods and, and to see your friends. But um, just like the old rendezvous days, you know, every convention I go to, we we all end up hanging around a campfire at night and cooking some good food and, and, and having some good drinks and just uh, having a grand old time. And uh, the New York State Trappers Convention is no different. I've been going to that for decades. And um, me and a, a, a guy, one of my best friends, his name's Vaughn Strawn. It's S-T-R-A-H-A-N, but they pronounce it Strawn. So his first name and last name kind of rhyme. But um, Vaughn's a, a, a colorful guy. He's a, he's a great trapper from New York. He's a little bit older than I am. And gosh, 12, 13 years ago, we were feeding everybody. And uh, he says to me, Zagger, you're a BS artist. Why don't you go get some money to help reimburse everybody, you know? So I walked around with a bucket. I didn't care. And, and, and I was shamelessly asking people to give me five bucks or 10 bucks to pay for the food that we all did. This is this was just friends sitting around. And, and of course, some some people that came in the, that we that weren't normally there. And um, I raised three or four hundred bucks, whatever it was. And I went over to Vaughn to give it to him because it was all his expense. And he says, you know what? Let's donate it to the Pat Arnold uh, youth camp. So um, Pat Arnold's a, a gal uh, who's uh, passed away in New York, but she had um, earmarked uh, funds to have a, tra a trapping training camp for you, for young kids. It's, it's still going on. And um, so before trapping season, 10, 15, 20 kids go to a, a place where they get permits to be allowed to actually set traps and instructors um like myself or Vaughn or whomever, uh, uh, teach these kids the basics of trapping, muskrat, beaver, mink, everything. So we decided right then and there that we would keep doing this every year. And we earmarked that money. We walked down and gave it to the nice and said, we said, we want this money to go to the Pat Arnold camp. So this thing, just like a lot of things grew from grassroots and, uh, I'll fast forward. Um, you know, the last couple of years we've been walking, three, four, five thousand dollars down to the to the New York State Trappers. And what we've done is this has grown into a, a thing. It's grown into this gigantic feed, but it's also turned to a to a, an auction. And so it's 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 all of us bringing something that we'd want to own ourselves. And it's a lot of auctions you go to with uh, trappers and, and conventions. There's there tends to be people just cleaning out their fur shed, getting rid of stuff they haven't used, like old greasy wire raccoon stretchers from 1978. That's not the kind of stuff we have at our auction. We have we have I make maple syrup, so I might bring a gallon of that. People make pies. People make strawberry jam. People carve decoys. People uh, make really nice fur stretchers. Uh, high-end traps, bear traps, you know, famous traps like Johnny Thorpe or Russ Carmen traps with their tags on them. And, 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 and items at this auction tend to go for a higher price than we'd get at a normal trapping auction because we're all there for a reason. And so if something really would probably go for 50 bucks, it might go for a hundred or more at our place. A, a really good example, the year my dad died in 2017, he made these really good hot peppers that everybody loved. And I brought a jar of my dad's peppers I, and I couldn't even talk. You know, I was, I was, I was doing the auction. I couldn't talk. I said, someone else has to say this about my dad. It was still very raw. Right. And, uh, and th this jar of peppers is like one of the last jars my dad made. It went for like 200 bucks. And this is the kind of thing we do. So 
a year and a half ago, two years ago, Vaughn, uh, our my main man Vaughn, he uh, he got stricken with uh, cancer. He uh, and and it, and it kind of went through him into some different places of his body. But it started out as prostate cancer, and uh, he's been fighting and battling like we all do. And, and he is a he's a stubborn son of a bitch, and he has he has fought his way through this. But he's had some complications recently. So a year or so ago, he came to me and said, "Hey, man, I want to write a book." Um, for the for the flat iron, the flat iron, by the way, is named after his farm in in the Finger Lakes region of, of New York. I forgot to say that. That's what we call our camp area, the flat iron. So Vaughn wanted to write a book about and have different authors pitch in and write a chapter, and it, it was all New York related. And so Joe Goodman, the the famous trapping artist, he had done a, a print that the New York State Trappers had commissioned him to do, and it kind of looks like Mount Rushmore, but it's all these famous trappers that. Their names transcend trapping and transcend New York State. You know, Johnny Thorpe and, and E.J. Daly and O.L. Butcher, names that everybody knows. And the idea I had was we have all these famous trappers from New York that are everybody knows about that are, are now unfortunately passed away. But there's this whole new generation of trappers that um, are, are good or maybe even better, frankly. And I think we have something to contribute. So it was a juxtaposition of the handoff of the baton from the, the past to the present. So that was kind of the theme that I put together with Vaughn and, and I chased everybody down um, to get chapters done and such. But when, when, when Vaughn first came to me and asked me to do this, I said, Vaughn, I don't have time. And, and, uh, and I'll never forget this. He looked at me and he said, you know, I, I don't either, but I really want to do this. And, 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 and I, I was reading between the lines there a little bit because he was already sick at that time. And I said, you know what, this is important to him. It's now important to me. And we did it. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got it done before last year's, uh, New York State Trappers Association. So we've 100% have funded it. We wrote the book, got it published. We pay for every copy, 100% from us. And then every dollar that they, when they sell a book for 30 bucks, they keep all 30 bucks. So it's 100% no cost to the New York State. So they love this, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we've taken this flat iron thing to a whole new level. Um, so every year it's, 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 it's not this coming weekend, but it's the weekend after it's Labor Day weekend. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right before Labor Day. It's the same time every year. Um, we're, we're going to try to make this the biggest and the best one ever. And, um, and, and the reason we're doing that is because we're going to switch gears and we're going to pivot. And, uh, I got, I got the buy-in from, uh, New York state trappers, um, who normally look forward to us giving them this bucket of money and, uh, fully understanding that we're going to raise more than ever and, and hand it right over to Vaughn and his family. And, uh, I can't begin to tell you the outpouring of, of support I've gotten from all around the country on this. And, and this platform might help a little bit, too. And, and, and what I'm really looking for, if, if, people, if, if people have something that's in their fur shed or shop that they like and they'd love to have on a wall, a sign, a, a, a fur stretcher, an old trap that's famous from a, a trapper in Iowa or something or something even of their own, something that they would like to have themselves or even and frankly, I'll even take cash donations. But we're doing everything we can to. Uh, to get that bucket full and overflowing and, and hand it to someone who really deserves it. And, 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 and whom without the flat iron wouldn't exist. You know, he's, he's the, he's the namesake and he's the, he was the catalyst of this whole thing. And yes, it's he and I together, but with, without Vaughn, there's no flat iron. Wow. Well, I'll be honest. Like I did have a look as you were going, I had a little bit of a hair raising on the back of my neck moment. And I say that because genuinely like the association meetups that I've been to the auctions. And even most recently I was in Colorado with Dan Gates and hearing him get fired up. But when I hear trappers get fired up, you know, year over year for the New York state trappers association, but then pivoting to support somebody who's done so much for trapping in New York and nationally, it's, it's really, I mean, to be cheesy, like heartwarming to see. So for those listening, what I'm going to do is you know first and foremost you can reach out to mark whether that's through facebook or whatever social media outlet you want to if you have something in your first shed or something that you'd want to donate to the auction that would bring some um, money in or if you want to do cash donations but uh, i'll put links whatever mark sends me whether there's like a, a, a donation link or anything like that so anybody listening who you know wants to open their purse strings and that's exactly what we're asking for there's no you know in between the lines like we're raising this stuff for vaughn so please, you know, give. I mean, it's a community. We are a tight knit community. Um, yeah, I'm sure you can reach out to Mark or see some of the posts he's done to find out a little bit more about the why behind it. Um, 
But yeah, anything else you want to add on that one, Mark? Yeah, I, I just, just touched on what you said. You know, I will tell you the dirty little secret is all these big, tough, crusty trappers. We all have soft white underbellies, and we're all a bunch of emotional bags of of, of mush. You know, and, and we just don't like to lead with it or show that. But when it gets right down to it, uh, trappers have been some of the most generous, if as a demographic, anybody I've ever seen, and uh, and, and frankly, generous. The people that I see that are most generous are the ones that probably can least afford it. And uh, and that really, to me, is very telling. Yep. And that has been my experience, too. And I think it's probably universal nationwide. So you know, people go check out the, the show notes, look at the links, reach out to Mark. If you're local to New York, go attend and you know raise awareness and raise money for somebody who genuinely deserves it, who's fighting hard both for trapping and for himself and his family. Yeah. And I only got to say, you know, knowing the short timelines, if anything were to come in after the fact, it still would go to him. And if it's, and if it's a, if it's an item, then we'll, we'll put, I have a, I have a big barn and I store stuff for next year and we'll auction it off next year. So we won't turn anything down. Perfect. <laughs> we're doing this. This is a legacy thing and we're going to do it from here on out uh, forever. So uh, uh, we're going to pass the baton to whomever's going to take it next. But for right now, it's Vaughn and I. Perfect. Well, we're going to shift gears. We're going to kind of now hit back into first and then go back into like our normal line of questionings because I know a lot of people listening want to know more about Mark. I know I want to know more about Mark. So I'm going to start with the question I ask everybody. Can you remember what your first memory ever of being exposed to trapping was? Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah, like it was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, as a young kid i always was a wildlife fanatic i was a i was nut on sunday night i couldn't wait to watch marlon perkins wild kingdom <laughs> you know what i mean that's way before your time but on sunday nights you got in your pajamas and you watched marlon perkins wild kingdom and, and walt disney world and then you went to bed but uh, i've always been an animal nut and um and i came from a hunting family and a fishing family but not a trapping family hmm. so where I grew up in Ohio, um, everybody's either Slovenian or Slovak or Serbian or Croatian. So my best friend's name was Rod Pradonovic, very Serbian guy. Mm -hmm. And him and his dad, uh, they, his dad was a big time rabbit hunter and duck hunter. And, and uh, so Rod says to me one day in passing, this is before cell phones and social media. So we didn't talk every minute about every little detail, you know. And he said to me, hey, I caught a mink in a trap. And I said, what do you mean you caught a mink in a trap? He goes, come see it. So I rode my bike over to his house. Mm -hmm. And um, even at that young age, I knew it wasn't a mink. I knew it was a weasel. And I said, that's not a mink. It's a weasel. I'm, this is like, I'm in like maybe fifth grade. And I said, but either way, it's cool. And it was a, the wrong size trap for weasels, weasel. It was a number three jump victor. And uh, he had done the old, uh, he, uh, his dad said, there's a log crossing the creek. He cut out a, a notch in it and put some moss in there. And he put this giant, you know, beaver trap in and he caught a weasel. And uh, I was blown away by this. I, you know, just to just to have that weasel in my hand, it was like we it was like our first GI Joes, which are also before your time. But uh, we were like, I was mesmerized by this little animal. And um, I went down to the hardware store and bought some traps. I, you know, my my mom and dad, we were the typical family in Ohio that you, no one gave us any money. We had to take our hay baling money or or our yard raking money or our newspaper money. And, and I went down, I bought a couple traps at the hardware store and I didn't know what I was doing. I was setting them for rabbits. I didn't know that you shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. You know, but I was just, I was a young kid, you know? So uh, fast forward um, that next, let's say that's 1976 in January of 1977, I could take you to the place where I caught my first muskrat. I bet you I could throw a, a beach towel and hit it. Huh. And uh, it was, a, and, and I could tell you the date, it was January 13th, 1977. And I had put a, a con of bear four muskrats in a, in a really narrow little stream ditch and uh, just a blind set. And I caught this giant fluffy muskrat and uh, I couldn't believe it. I was, I, and I set for it, but I still couldn't believe it. It's just, it didn't make any sense to me that it happened that quickly, but you know, now what I know about muskrats, it's not, it's not that surprising, but um, I, I rode that thing on, on my bike and I was showing everybody that I could show, you know, this thing. And until you hold a muskrat, you don't I remember everybody saying even back then, Oh, their fur is so nice. Cause when you yeah. think the name muskrat, it doesn't come across right. It's not the best sales job. Right. But uh, wonderful, wonderful fur. And gosh, in January, I couldn't get any better. Right. So that thing tripped the trigger in me and that was it. I haven't missed a season since. <laughs> well, that's amazing. And, you know, 77. So this is kind of getting towards the peak of the fur boom. 
of that time. So when you got that first muskrat, you know, you're elated, you're riding around on your bike, you're showing people off the fur. Like, did you know what to do with it at that point? Like, did you like immediately understand to skin it or were you trying to sell it green? Were you trying to sell it at all? What was kind of the process then? Yeah. So even though I had a handful of traps, you know, I didn't have a place to do that. And none of, none of, none of us did, none of us uh, skids did. Obviously you could skin a muskrat anywhere, but I didn't know that at the time, but it was very, very common to sell fur in the round then. Right. And uh, every town had three or four fur buyers. So um, the fur buyer in the next town over, his name was Leonard Luoma. Hmm. Um, I ended up working there later on in life, but uh, when I was in 10th grade skinning muskrats, ironically, but uh so Leonard Luoma had, had the local fur shop and it was like, it was like when you, when you'd walk in there it, at first, it wasn't this way, but later on in life, I used to be terrified to go in there because I thought everybody in there was an expert trapper and, and they'd look down their nose at me, but the smells and the sounds and the, and uh, the men and, uh, and just the, the atmosphere was, was really cool, but also intimidating at the same time, you know, but uh, when my mom got home from work that night, I had her drive me up to Leonard Lomas. It was dark. I'll never forget. I bought, you know, in January, it's when it gets dark at four o'clock. And uh, I walked in there and I had this one muskrat and they recognized immediately that I was new. I was young, obviously. And uh, they might've gave me a little more for it than they should have, but this was at the peak of, I mean, this was the fur boom was like this. And I will tell you, Hand to God, thirteen dollars for the now, one rat, one muskrat. Now, in unscun, as we'd say, scun. Scun, scun is a word in the trapping world. <laughs> it's not in your literature world, but in our world, it's a word. So it was unscun, and it was thirteen bucks. And man, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I, this is when we used to get a quarter per per bale to bale hay or whatever we would get, you know. So that was really something. And then you know, we didn't have a lot when I was a kid, so the money was very intriguing to me. You know, if I were to leap way ahead now and everything in between, the, the reason I stuck with trapping and I haven't missed the season because the money thing paled in importance to me compared to the overall experience. And, and that's why I stuck with it because, and I, I don't mean to jump ahead, but you know, every airport bar I'm in America, every time I go anywhere, I meet, I meet a guy that's my age or a little older who um, used to trap when he was my age and got out of it when the money went out of it. And uh, now he's getting back into it. And a lot of my students are that way. They got out of it because the money went out of it. I was that one guy in my school that stuck with it all these years. And, and uh, because it wasn't solely about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, l- let me ask you about that then. So you're a young kid. This is pre high school. You catch your first muskrat, you sell it unscun for 13 bucks. Going into high school, then you must have had a little more pocket change than your you know, schoolmates. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, you know, yes and no. You know, so I, you know, where I went to school in Ohio, it was a small town, but there were still haves and have nots. Right. And I was probably somewhere in the middle. You know, I tell people the story that we used to have to work all summer to pay for our school clothes and and people like, what? You know, so we never had a lot of anything. And, and frankly, any, any money that I would have generated from trapping was just like a newspaper route or throwing bales of hay or raking yards. It went to other things that we needed or had to have, or if I wanted to buy more traps, that's where I was, I was going to get it. It wasn't, my dad wasn't going to hand me 50 bucks. There's no way in the world was that happening. Um, my dad and mom were great to me, but that they were very old fashioned, old school. And, and, um, and, and you, you bought what you needed, not what you wanted. And, uh, and, and I, we certainly fell into that category. So no, I wasn't walking around with fancy, uh, <laughs> fancy jeans or fancy coats. I, I probably look just like it normally did, but uh, at least I was paying for some of that stuff myself, you know, but, and, and, and frankly, getting more traps, building that inventory that I needed to go to the next level, you know? And, and with that inventory and going to that next level. So you, I'm imagining that you probably stuck with selling, you know, essentially green fur, unscun for quite a while. At what point did you start to tip over into kind of the full end to end trapping experience of, setting catching to actually you know figuring out a pseudo fur shed and grabbing a knife and actually skinning them yourselves was it an economic decision or was it an exploration into just being able to do all of it it was really kind of a husbandry thing in that you know we had at our house where we lived we didn't live in the country we lived in town but we had you know it was still a country town but um, we had a typical hand laid, laid stone basement and the boiler was downstairs and in the back recesses was an old fruit cellar and we had it just full of, you know, junk probably. And uh, 
I was looking around there one day and I said, man, I, I think I could make this work. And if I, if I went in there now, I'd probably think I was in a manhole. It was so tight down there. But at the time I thought it was huge, you know, and I just needed some two by fours on the ceiling with some nails or hooks in them. And, and so I would say it was like around probably ninth or 10th grade that I uh, created that first shop downstairs and, and uh, got a flushing beam and, and had my traps in there and other things. I was largely chasing water animals at that time, but uh, I was starting to dabble with red fox. But um, yeah, I started skinning probably. Well, I, I'll t now that I'm putting this connecting the dots in my head, um, I got that job at Loma skinning muskrats, and that's when I started skinning in my own basement because now I had the confidence to do it mm. because they wouldn't they wouldn't let us skin anything besides muskrats. But there was <clears throat> you'd go come in every night after work, and there'd be mountains of them. Have at it, you know, and then the, the skilled skinners were handling the red fox and even the raccoons and the rare beaver or whatever it was. So um, we were just muskrat skinners. Do you remember what your uh, first paycheck looked like or what were you were getting per rat for skinning them out and fleshing they them? They were paying us 50 cents a rat. Um, and no matter how many we did, that's that's how they kept track. So when you skin, there was other boys in there skinning and they would have us throw them in the pot. And, and 50 cents probably in hindsight looks big, but um, they were worth you know, well, if they were paying me 13, that means they were getting paid. Right. So there, there was some money in there to, uh, and, 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 and back then it's funny the there's been a, a, a change, 180 degree change in that when I was a kid and when I was growing up trapping, no one had fur tumblers in their fur shops. Only people that had fur tumblers were tanneries, uh, ranch fur places and fur buyers. Now there's no fur buyers left. And now because fur handling is, kind of gotten to a different level of expertise. Um, and certainly guys coming to my school see this, you know, probably 75% of the guys I know that put up a lot of fur have fur tumblers now. So it's just been done 180 degree turn, you know, but um, yeah, working in that, working in that fur shop uh, gave me a ton of experience and confidence. And, um, and I got just, just through, you know, osmosis. I just learned a lot from those guys that were in there. But even back then, man, I'm telling you, these guys, Leonard Loma trapped uh, Fox with a guy named Jerry Thomas. They used to go to Maine every year and they caught hundreds and hundreds of them. This is before the coyotes were big out this way. And uh, even those guys were top secret, man. They wouldn't tell you anything. You'd try, but they'd be like, eh. you lock one, of the, down. one of the funniest stories, uh, there was a national convention in Ohio, uh, MTA, and my friends could go and I couldn't go because I was working as a 10th or 11th grader and my friend came back and he went to a demo and I said what was the demo about he said it was about trapping gray fox in grapevines and in the grapevines and I said and, and I go well what'd you learn because I can't tell you and and in and, 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 and hindsight it's such a ridiculous notion that there was a demo about that and only that but the fact that he wouldn't tell me just <laughs> compelled me to just want to know more and I, what am I missing out on you know you, you it was the the FOMO thing right but I didn't go myself and uh so I didn't get a chance to learn that, but he, I don't know that he ever caught a gray fox in the grapevine. So I guess that didn't pay out for him. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Yeah. There's a little bit of that that still exists today, as I'm sure you know, but it, it oh. is an interesting thing to, to hyper analyze, but you know, I normally reserve this question for later, but given that in high school, you were just starting to skin, you were getting paid to skin muskrats. I got to know, and it might be during this time frame, and it might not. So you answer it how you want. But I want to know what the biggest mistake you've ever made in the first shed is. And I'm curious if it happened when you were just starting out or if there's been other big mistakes you've made in your first shed as you kind of progressed into your fur trapping career. Well, I've done a lot of dumb things in first sheds that I probably can't say. But uh, um, I've done every I've made every mistake you can make, you know, uh, taking coyotes out to thaw and laying them on a freezer. And as they thaw out, they get more flaccid and then they fall behind the freezer and I don't know they're back there. And then like three days later, I smell them and ruining them. You know, those kind of things happen all the time. Uh, unplugging, one of my, my best one was we came back from Kansas and I had a freezer full of Kansas coyotes, higher dollar coyotes. This was a few years ago when things were really high. And um, I unplugged my freezer thinking I was unplugging something else. Oh. And uh, I walked in my barn like a week later. I'm like, what's that smell? And I panicked, man. I panicked because these aren't just my coyotes. Me and my partner are in this together um, when we go to Kansas. And I panicked, you know, and just so, it's something as simple as unplugging the wrong thing from the wrong receptacle. So I've done those things. I've made a million holes. You know, I, I've, I've, I've done. The only way you can get really good at handling fur, I think, is you have to make all those mistakes. You have to have the you have to have the um, 
the holes and the rips and the tears and the taking too much flesh off, leaving too much flesh on. There's all those things. And I won't tell the whole story, but I, I tell a funny story at Coyote U. I think it's funny. Um, when I was, you can't see me because I'm sitting down, but I'm, I'm, I'm not the biggest guy in camp, but I'm not the smallest, but I, I'm 6'2". And uh, I shot up to this height in 10th grade. So I went from being a normal sized kid to being taller than most kids in my class. So um, at the first shed, uh, the, Leonard Loom and all his guys, they were all, they were all kind of, shorter than me. So they used to call me big guy. So, uh, and I always liked that. I thought that was a great nickname. Hey, big guy. Hey, big guy. Well, I won't tell you the whole house story, how this found out is it, it's really a long story, but five, six years after I worked there, I ran into these guys and I was talking and I, and I mentioned the fact that I always liked that they called me big guy. <clears throat> and they looked at each other and they started laughing. They said, we weren't calling you big guy. We were calling you big eye. Because every muskrat you skinned had huge eyes because you screwed them up. And uh, here's my two heroes. I'm de I'm decimated. You know, I, I can't believe that my whole life I thought they were calling me big guy. They were making fun of my skinny and I had no idea. But if you really think about it, the, the vernacular, it sounds the exact same. Big guy versus big eye. So for all these years, I walked around thinking I was the cock of the block and they were making fun of me. I didn't even know it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's perfect trapper parlance too because there's no <laughs> no community that will ride you harder than a trapper too but then there's also no community that has enough ego attached to where you thought ah big guy that makes sense yeah. i'm yes. awesome all right uh, that's yeah. awesome i mean that's, that's, that's a great story now yeah. i know a little bit about your background so you are going out of high school you're skinning muskrats you're loving your trap line fur mark is probably starting to go down a little bit what was your path after high school? Did you kind of go the trade route? Did you go the normal or what was being pushed at the time, the kind of college route? What did life look like for you post high school where you had just a lot of time to run trap lines? Yeah, um, I, I did go to college uh, and uh, my dad was a Marine. And, and my first year of college, me and my high school sweetheart, broke up and I was devastated and I, I was acting like I wasn't going to go to college anymore. My dad being a typical Marine said, fine, let's go down to the recruiting office. And I went right back to my studies. I said, I don't want to do that. Nothing against Marines, but my dad was, you know, he was, he was tough with that kind of stuff. And I, I'm like, no, I'll go to college. <laughs> so um, I went to school, pri a little small private school in Ohio called Hiram college. And it's a pre-med pre-vet school. And I went there for wildlife biology. I, I, mm. I was that kid. I told you earlier, I got to pick up my dog. Yeah. Um, I was that kid that, uh, Sorry. I was that kid that knew what he wanted to do his whole life. And that was going to be work with animals somehow, some way. And uh, I guess I still am. But uh, the. Uh, so when I went there for that and I and I Hiram was a very famous biology school and, and I took care of coyotes and fox. I, I worked at the biology station. I was right in my swim lane, man. And then just like a lot of young kids, what I thought I wanted to do maybe started to change and there was outside influence to that. There was guys that lived in my dorm talking to me about how they were going to make a million dollars and, and wildlife biologists don't and things like that. So I, I, I switched gears um, in my uh, junior year and, and uh, ended up with a major in, in, in business management and a minor in wildlife biology, which is kind of interesting. And, uh, but at the end of the day, I don't think it mattered. I finished, you know, I, in my current world, I, we hire people all the time and, we can argue all day long whether college is important or not, but I, I always look at it as a way of just saying, hey, at least a guy finished something. And and, and that's not always easy, you know, and um, and that's kind of where I was. But my dad was kind of disappointed at the time, I remember, because he said, man, I always thought you wanted to stick with this animal thing. But, hmm. you know, <clears throat> after after I got out of college and my life took its its path and, and everything that uh, kind of came its way through trapping and some other things, he couldn't argue with, you know, it just ended up being just fine. And um, it did. When I see some of my buddies that are, you know, trapping Rocky Mountain bighorns and radio collaring them and doing stuff like that, you know, I, I'm a little envious of that. But um, I still work enough with wildlife and with people and and, and animals, and, and all, it's all kind of intertwined and interrelated. That I think I'm okay, and uh, I, I don't really regret it. And, and with the business degree, what did you do right out of college? And then I want to tack on to that question, you know it sounds like from what you answered earlier that you were trapping all through college and continued to trap immediately after too. But how, what did you do after college? And then how did you juggle 
you know, trapping, and especially at a time where it was becoming less, you know, fruitful from an economic perspective and whatever your day job was. Yeah. So, um, my uh, junior year and, and senior year in college in the summer, I worked at a company called Packard Electric in Ohio, which was a uh, division of General Motors. So my entire family, where I, where I grew up in Ohio, it's all steel mills or automobile, mm -hmm. uh, automotive. And uh, so my parents, grandparents, both sides of the family all worked in those places. And um, they had an internship uh, program at General Motors. And uh, if you're if your parents work there, it gave you a much better chance to get one of those coveted jobs. And I did. I got one. And you understand at the time. So picture 1985, 86 minimum I wage. Was, I was an infant. So, yeah, it's very I, clear for me. Yeah. You weren't even born yet. No, you were. But uh, so back then, the minimum wage was three thirty five an hour. And uh, most of my friends were working for that or less. And the General Motors internship was going to pay me seven fifty. And, uh, you know, I, I chased that, but it was really cool because I was, it's going to be seem hard to believe, but they had me in a role where I was, let's say you were a supervisor at General Motors. You, because of your experience, you'd bounce around to all the different departments when people took vacation in the summer, but you were, you were my mentor and I worked for you and I took over your department while you bounced around, but you were my advocate and you were never far away from me and I managed your department. So here's a snot nosed college kid managing union auto workers. And, 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 and that's at a really a 38,000 foot level. It really wasn't that. There was other people. But, but if they wanted to take a break or do anything, they had to come to me. So that union experience, I, I, you know, I could have got a job right out of GM, right at GM, right out of college. I didn't have I had no interest in it. Hmm. Um, but companies like Federal Express and Roadway Express and all these transportation companies that had union outfits when they were interviewing at my school and I interviewed with them just for practice, they my resume resonated with them. Like we're talking to a college kid that already has union experience. You know, when can you start? And so I, I took a job with a company out of Akron, Ohio called Roadway Express. You probably used to see the trucks up and down the highway all the time. They're no longer in business, but they eventually got bought out. Uh, and, 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 and I ended up working for Roadway Package System, which was their small package division that uh, was competed with UPS or FedEx. And then that got out, got bought out by FedEx. And that's where I ended up. And that's what brought me to New, uh, New York from my from Ohio. And um, and then because of coyote trapping, <laughs> um, I was working at FedEx. I was working uh, for a guy uh, named Cy, and he had a 1,200 acre farm here in New York, and I was catching coyotes for him. And uh, his company was headquartered in Atlanta at the time, and he wanted to buy some tanned coyote pelts off me that I'd caught on his farm. And I met him, and I was I was working that day. I had a company car, a Chevy Lumina. <laughs> I was wearing a suit and tie, and. Uh, I get, he meets me at his, at his farm and he says, what's going on with you? Are you going to a funeral or something like that? I go, no, I'm working. He goes, what are you working? And I said, I, I, I'm a sales, I'm an account executive. And uh, he's like, man, I always thought that you weren't the typical trapper that he pictured in his mind, you know? And, 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 and again, that's not meant as a detriment to anybody else. That was just his own vision. And uh, he said, man, listen, I just started this new company. It's taken off. I need new talent. If you, if you are interested in, in, in talking to me further, let's go. And, 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 so this is in 1999, and he what he what his company does, and what I still do today is we build cell towers and public safety towers. But at the time when I went to work for him, it was all about cell phones and cell towers. And I remember thinking, I just got married. I remember thinking, gosh, I'm really rolling the dice here. This is might this might not be this might not stick around. It might be a gimmick, a, a passing fad. And boy, I couldn't have been more wrong. But um, the reason I ended up with uh, talking to him about that, and the reason I am now um, senior vice president in the company 25 years later is because of coyote trap. <laughs> That's too cool. Well, I have a few questions in there. You started out water trapping hard. At what point kind of in that career evolution going from these different companies out of school to where you ended up meeting the guy you eventually worked for trapping coyotes on his ranch? Like when did you make the switch to really start going after canines? Because like everything we've talked about, up to now has been mostly water trapping, but you're known as a coyote guy. So when yeah. did that kind of flip switch? Was it when you were in Ohio or was it when you came to New York or somewhere in between? No, it, it was probably when I was in college. I, I caught Fox. Um, I'll, I'll give you another date. <laughs> October 21st, 1978 is when I caught my first Red Fox. And again, I can take it right to the spot. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I had a couple of years where I, I didn't catch any, you know, and, and that first one was probably a fluke. Uh, it was a pup of the year. I remember now, but uh, I, uh, 
I caught a few fox in, in high school, but when I was in college, I had more time and more uh, and more ac access to more farms than I could drive um, is when I really started catching more of those. But I never I was catching everything when I was in college, mostly raccoons and culverts under the roads. But I, um, I was catching fox, beaver, everything. But when I when I got out of college and got transferred to Pennsylvania, um, I, I ended up. I went down to a place called Altoona, Pennsylvania. I didn't want to go there, but uh, I ended up there. And, and from a trapping standpoint, it was heaven on earth. I caught the first year I trapped in Pennsylvania, I caught over 100 red fox. And I hadn't caught 100 in my lifetime. You understand? Not even close. So it was like, wow. And that's when I was like, this is for me. And I, I've caught plenty of muskrats and beaver and mink and raccoons since then. But that was the catalyst for me to kind of change and, 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 and kind of kind of be focused on the canine. So when I got transferred to New York in, uh, after college, I graduated 87 when I graduated uh, right at the fur boom, when the, when the stock market crashed, um, the fur prices couldn't have been worse. And I came up to New York in 88. And, um, uh, the first year I tracked here, I caught 14 coyotes and that even back then 14 coyotes here was thought to be unheard of, you know, and, and, but I, I think I lost about 23 or 24 because I was using one and a half coils and 1.75s and rebar stakes. I was not rigged for coyotes. I was basically tra fox trapping my coyotes and I was lucky to hang on to the 14 that I did, but I lost more than I caught. And that was the start of my education. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. So, and then I got to know about the uh, kind of Batman effect of, you know, during the day you're in your suit and tie going around. <laughs> how, how did you manage? Because everybody who's a trapper knows people who are listening, who are thinking about trapping might be getting to know based on the conversations I've had, but trapping is a second full-time job. So like, how are you handling your family? Like, were you waking up and going to these farms, checking lines, you know, setting traps before work and checking after work? What did that setup look like for those years? Yeah, well, I'll go back a little, a little bit even before that. You know, I when nuisance wildlife was just kind of starting as a, as a new thing, um, I started a nuisance wildlife business when I was still uh, before I worked at Pyramid, my current company, and uh, and I had I made all the I made all the mistakes everybody made. This is before social media, before YouTube, before I had to create my own contract. I didn't know about insurance. So I was just learning on the job, right? And uh, one day I came into the office after taking raccoons out of chimneys all night and working all night and doing bats and all this stuff. And my boss said to me, Zagger, you got to choose between us or animals. Which one are you going to do? Because and at the time, FedEx was paying me pretty, pretty well. And I said, you know what? You're right. I, I need to I'm I'm not doing justice or service to either one of them, you know. So I kind of think that apply, it plays out in our going back to your question. You know, I found that if I was trying to do my job and trap the way I want to do it at a high level. I can't do both at the same time. So I just worked my way into a place where I was doing three or four weeks of vacation mm. and being monofocused during those that time and trapping and going full bore and, 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 and then going back to work afterwards. And before my responsibilities changed at pyramid, I, I could do that easier. Uh, mm. When I was only, I shouldn't say set when I only had the sales division of our company and only had a few employees underneath me, that was easy. Now that I have a lot of employees under me and I have the operation, um, my phone rings incessantly. There's constant conference calls and all these different things. So what I found a few years ago was I, I wasn't able to disconnect like I like to. I wasn't able to take that three weeks and totally uh, let go. And it, it, it became less enjoyable because I was still working every day, you know. But I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is I, in, for me personally, I'm like an all in type of guy. So. I have a hard time working and trapping at the same time. I understand that's the reality that a lot of us face and we have to do it. And of course I've checked a million traps before and after work and after school. But if I could, if I really want to do justice and service to both <laughs> masters, then I, I need to do one or the other. And uh, then that's kind of where I ended up. And, and, and so the last few years when I was, you know, just taking the three or four weeks, um, yeah, that's when my number, that's when the numbers got really big, you know, the, the biggest, the biggest issue all of us have is time, right? And, and the year I went from two weeks to three weeks was the first time I broke 100 coyotes. And it was just time. You know, I, and, and it's the same with anybody. And it's very simple math. You're a math guy, you know. And and uh, if I set 50 traps and check them, I, I'll catch more, more than like if I set 100 traps. And it's just that simple. It's just that simple basic ratio, a uh, catch ratio. And, and at the end of the day, 
someone said it a long time ago. I didn't originate it, but uh, everything else being equal, the guy that runs the most miles and the most traps wins. Yeah. You know? And I think so, that's a good, uh, you know, that's something I've had to wrestle with is still being, you know, an employed uh, individual up until I lost my job for a time last year. And, and just to kind of reflect what you're saying, that time period where I didn't have to work and I could be mono focused, I had the best season of my life. Um, right. Which was great. So it's interesting because, you know, I'll take off week or two to go archery elk hunting every year. But I haven't really put that thought into saying, like, maybe what if I did that for my wolf trapping for a couple weeks in the winter and really focused on that? Uh, you're giving me stuff to chew on. But I want to keep going because, man, we're already almost 40 minutes in and I have so many more questions. <laughs> Time flies. We might have to do a part two. Okay. Um, speaking of coyotes. I just want to know outright, what's the most unique thing that you've learned about coyotes in your years of trapping? It could be about the animal itself. It could be about their trap behavior. What's just the most unique thing? You know, they're all individuals. And while any coyote can be trapped, you know, I, I think the reason people are drawn to coyotes and coyote trapping is because of that challenge. And I know that's, that's cliche to say that, but, um, just when you think you got them figured out and know it all, one will, one will do something to make you pull your hair out. And uh, sometimes you just don't have the time to put in to kill that coyote. They're, they're amazing. I, I have a section of my coyote you and I, and I say, do I hate coyotes or do I love them? I'll post a picture online of 100 coyotes on the barn and, and guys will say, oh, that's great. I hate them SOBs. You saved a bunch of deer and turkeys and lambs, all that stuff. And I'm, I couldn't be more opposite. I have the utmost respect for this animal. And I, you know, I, I understand I'm going to kill them and I have to do that, but I don't relish that. I don't relish that part of it, but I don't know that there's an animal that I have more respect for than a coyote. They are the ultimate survivor. And, um, man, we've thrown bullets and arrows and snares and poison and, and shoot them out of airplanes and helicopters. And we've done everything in the world. And there's just as many now as there's ever been, you know, they just, uh, because of that unique ability to survive, I, I think that's what makes them just not a pushover when it comes to our, our, our offerings, you know, and, and, uh, I could come into a, a, a farm pond and set 50 traps and, and, and hope to catch 25 or 30 muskrats the next day if they're there. If I set 50 traps for coyote and I catch two or three, you know, that's about right, you know, on that first night or second night and, 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 and whatever. So it's a game of inches. It's a game of miles and it's, it's a game of time and patience. And, uh, I fully expect to catch several coyotes every day, but the only way I'm going to do that is to run more traps than the average guy. And, uh, but you know, they just, whenever somebody gets a hold of me because they have a coyote problem is the time. It's like when someone rides with you deer hunting or, or fishing or, or rabbit hunting, the time you have a witness is when something goes wrong or your dogs chase deer or the, boat doesn't have the plug in it or you know something so as soon as someone hears about my prowess as a coyote trapper and they want me to come trap coyotes on their deer leases when things just seem to get more difficult you know it's just it's just the funniest thing and that's when the coyotes that i'm after are, are giving me fits or whatever they guys expect you to roll in because you're mark zagger and you got all these coyotes under your belt and you're going to wipe out seven the first night and their problem's over we couldn't be any further from the truth you know i try to explain to these guys you have a house yes in the winter do you have mice in your house yes do you trap them? Yes. The next year, do you have mice again? Yes. Well, same with coyotes. You're going to have them again here next year. I'm not here to eradicate them. No one can do that. And uh, and 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 I, I think I, I go out of my way to make sure the people that either hire me or let me trap know how much respect I have for this animal. That I'm not this um, this hater. Contract. You're not a contract killer. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's a good way to put it. Wow. And with that love for coyotes. I also know that you have a passion for sharing that knowledge too, which again, kind of goes counter to some of the hush hush uh, tendencies of trappers of old and somewhat still in our current era, but you eventually founded Coyote U. Can you tell me a little bit about how that came about? You know, what is it? Where is it? Who attends? Who can attend? And what yeah. that whole structure looks like? No, that's great. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've been doing demos at, at conventions for 25 years. You know, as soon as you catch a handful of coyotes, it, it becomes noteworthy and then and, and, and you have a name for yourself. So I've been bouncing around the country and bouncing around PA, New York, Maine and doing demos everywhere. And then, you know, instruction and, and taking instructions is nothing that's foreign to me. I, I've paid 
for track and instruction myself with names like Craig O'Gorman and Ray Milligan, you know, Johnny Thorpe, the Leggetts. I mean, really well-known people. And, and I've never been afraid to do that. And, you know, when I started catching coyotes in numbers, this is right when, you know, it was before social media, but some of these trapping forums were starting to take off. And I started posting pictures and people are like, wow, who's this guy? You know, six coyotes in one day or five or, you know, whatever it was, and let alone 60 or 70 for a season. And my numbers only got better from there. And people back then would say, when are you going to write a book? When are you going to come out with a DVD? And I'm like, dude, I don't even have 500 coyotes under my belt. You know, are you, are you kidding me? So, but I've always in my... I'm a book guy, not not dissimilar from yourself. Uh, I'm a voracious reader, and, and I've always thought, boy, when I buy a DVD or I buy a, a, a V before DVDs and the VHS types the tapes that we used to get from Tom Moran and these guys, there's like a commitment to watch those. And I always thought, boy, if I was going to do anything, it'd be a book. Because the nice thing about a book is, uh, including your book that I read, I can put it somewhere and read it a couple chapters at a time, come back to it. It's not that it's not the time suck that a to watch a full DVD is. So I've always been building this framework in my mind of of a book and um so in in 2015 we started this me vaughn and i and two other guys started a thing called the elite trappers in new york and, and we we started a, a, an instruction uh two days of instruction four instructors that covered everything and then the next year a guy named mark june who you may be familiar with he he's a bait and lure maker a, a, a very good well-known trapper he put together the Mark June Academy and asked me to be an instructor. So I went down to Texas and I told Mark before I went down, I said, listen, I already have it in my mind that I'm going to do something myself. Because what I what I did recognize that I was catching coyotes in numbers in a part of the country that no one else was doing it. And, I, and if, I'd be naive and arrogant to think that no one was doing it, but no one that I knew of mm -hmm. and, and no one that was no, well known or certainly not on the Internet or anything. So. You know, a guy catching 100, 125, even 150 coyotes. In one year in New York, I got 183 coyotes. And those were those were 200-inch whitetail numbers, right? You know, they're just off the charts. And um, and I had, I, you know, you have to have some self-awareness in life. And I and I recognized that <clears throat> I, I, I'm not afraid to pub speak publicly. I have a really, really nice venue here to hold such a class. Um, I had thousands and thousands of picture uh, photographs and videos that I've been saving for years. And then I had this framework in my mind of this book that just fell perfectly in line, like a, a, an agenda or a curriculum for a school. And, and, and it wasn't a coincidence that I called it coyote U because it, it's very much, it's very much a, a format of, of a school. And, uh, and I, and I worry about saying that to guys, because what I always tell people is, but it's not going to be boring like what you did at school and where you hated it. Um, we're going to have a day of classroom. And I promise you, you won't fall asleep because everything I say, I'm going to back up on the screen behind me. Mr. PowerPoint, I have a PowerPoint with 800 photos and videos in it that I go through in that day. So if I say when I talk about remakes and the challenges thereof and how I do it, I show behind me on the screen five or six or seven examples of this working. It's not just me saying, it's me actually showing it. And, 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 and I've had a million guys that want to ride with me and I tell them all the same thing. I, I would tell you this, if you roll with me for one day, I'm going to show you some stuff. And yeah, you might see some coyotes and traps. Guys like to see that, but all these other things that are going to happen to you, like snow trapping, rain, all these different things that can happen, digger coyotes, whatever it is, the chances of you seeing any of that, let alone one of those, that one day you ride with me slim. So let me show you the entire, uh, my entire uh, playbook, for lack of a better word, and every little scenario that can be thrown at you and all the challenges thereof, and, and that's Coyote U. So day one's classroom, day two's out on the line, and day three's uh, fur handling in the fur shed. And uh, I always tell people, I think I'm a pretty good coyote trapper, but I'm, I know I'm a good fur handler, and, and I, I'm always a top lot guy. And I, I feel if you're going to put the time into it, why not do it right? That's awesome. And, and for me... It's impressive that you had the wherewithal early, even when you weren't putting up the numbers that you have recently to be taking pictures and documenting it with the known intent. Like maybe you didn't have Coyote U in your head, but you knew there was a, a time that you were going to want to share this information. So I, I have a follow on question, which is what is it that has made you open to sharing about your playbook? so to speak. Of course, it comes with a price, which is deserved. But why be open when a lot of the other 
historically trappers have been closed off about their playbook? And, and it's a really good question. You know, I, I think I think a number of things have, have come together and, and kind of made the perfect storm for it. But uh, I really think I have something valuable to offer. And I, and I think I present it in a way that people have a blast. It, it's a nice backdrop. And um, it, it just if I gave you all the information that I have in Coyote in a book, it wouldn't be nearly, nearly, I think, as exciting or fun or interesting and, and, and interactive as, as doing the class. And um, I don't mind, I don't mind, this is going to sound bad, but I don't mind being the center of attention. I don't mind standing up in front of a room. I stand out. I could be a class clown. I, I am a clown. I, my brother, sister, and I were all class clowns, believe it or not. So I, I stand up and, and am really quick on my feet. And we just, People ask me questions and I react and, and, and it's in a good, fun way where everybody's by the, when everybody shows up on day one, everybody's nervous and no one knows everybody. Everybody's got name tags. By the time they leave, they're hugging, they're trapping together, they're hunting together. They become best friends. And I get I, and I, I have a chance to present that platform to do that. I'm just going to put this dog down. Yep. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> having the ability to teach and, and, and have something to share and do that in a, in a confident manner and to be able to convey your thoughts and articulate um kind of the yin and the yang of it all i think is is something that not everybody has and i'm not i'm not saying i do but i know that there's guys that don't and 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 all those things kind of came together like spokes on a wheel to a hub and i said i'm gonna do coyote you and you know i i've been doing it since 2016 this will be my 20th class this september i've been full every every year and i never i never know for sure if i've been doing it again next year i won't beg anybody to come if it, if it loses steam and and, and people don't want to come anymore it was a great run that's inspiring. And for people listening, I'll also include a link to Coyote U in the show notes too. So go check it out. I'm assuming you're full for this September. Is that a right assumption or? I am. Yeah. So my the next class I'd be booking for would be next April. My wife always says to me, why don't you do this when it's warm out? I said, like, if I took you down the road to one of my farms now, the corn's 13 feet high. It's hot. It's miserable. You know, that's not what guys want to do it. So I do it in April, around here in April, because we're, we're in the snow belt. In April, we still might have snow up here, but uh, the fields haven't been plowed yet. If you drove around with me in April, the fields would look exactly like they look in November, December. And then, so I do it. I do it in April to get that that fall look, and then I do it in September, which is a little early, but it's the last week of September uh, when guys are chasing elk normally. But uh, it's uh, it, it the corn's been a lot of the corn has been taken down. I, I, I trap in dairy country, so it's a lot of silage corn. So that's already been. A lot of it's been uh, has been chopped. So I try to I want to replicate actual trapping conditions and, and and show people show the guy, the students that come here what I actually do in a real world situation, not picture this cornfield being gone this year because it's 13 foot tall right now. I want to I want to get down on my knees and play in the dirt right there. Awesome. Um, so we've got about eight minutes left. I'm going to start doing lightning rounds because I've got chunks of questions. So. We talked about the biggest mistakes in the fur shed. What's the biggest mistake you've ever made on your trap line? Um, the year I caught 183 coyotes, and I don't know if it's a mistake or a regret, but I knew too much. I, I, I used too much in my head, and I talked myself out of doing something that I should have done. We get lake effect snow here. We get 100, 200, 300 inches of snow a year, so that shuts you down. We can't use snares in New York. So I had, a, I had more coyotes than I've ever had, and I was trapping – before work and after work in January and February, because we had no snow. This was, I started it in Christmas. I was just running 20 sets right around here. And they were biting like I've never seen before. And I was having ratios. I was checking 20 traps and catching five or six canines every day. Red fox, coyotes, and grace. There was no snow. There was no hunters. There was no dog walkers. There was no barn cats. I had the world to myself. So I kept thinking to myself, man, I should... I should take next year's vacation now and just clobber the snot out of these things and, and go to a number that I would never be able to do again. And uh, I'm like, no, nah, but as soon as I do that, we're going to get lake effect snow tomorrow. And we're going to, I'll be out of business. So I kept talking my, I kept doing it all the way through January before you knew if February was there. And I had, and I had already got the entire month of January that if I had just done it, then my numbers would have been unbelievable. So now we get into February and I keep it going. It never snowed. It was the one winter we've never had snow up here. And, and the regret and the mistake I made was to, I knew too much. I talked to myself out of it. You know, I need to be young and dumb and not even do something stupid. But I, 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 I my wisdom and my, my past experience talked me out of it. And, and I regret, I regret it every day. Yeah, <laughs> but 183 is going to have to do. Yeah. There's uh there's something to be said for intuition. Um, 
next question. What do you see as the future of trapping? It's a loaded, tough one. No, I, you know, it, it's kind of, it, it, I'm going to probably speak out of both sides of my mouth. My initial gut answer is ADC, animal damage control. We, you know, we talked earlier about skilled trades. Um, a lot of guys I know have very, very successful, high end, high dollar nuisance businesses. People don't know how to do this stuff themselves. But if you're going to get a nuisance work, you also got to get into carpentry and, and construction type thing because it's not just trapping a skunk, it's preventing them from coming back or taking a raccoon out of a chimney. You got to put a chimney cap on. You take bats out of a church, you got to be able to uh, seal that place up so they never come back. So, but I'll tell you, COVID really changed things. COVID, uh, uh, you're a stats guy. You could probably find this stuff out. But I know in New York State and Pennsylvania, they had record numbers of fur licenses and hunting licenses sold during the first two years of COVID. And then we drew in a bunch of new people, which is refreshing with the with the current climate of the younger people out there right now who just want to look at their phones all day long. But uh, this new insert, this new resurgence of interest in trapping hasn't seemed to wane, uh, even though COVID has passed us. Um, and when you go to conventions now, they're never like the good old days and they're never like the, during the fur boom. But if you talk to dealers, they're like, wow, I'm, I'm doing great. And a, a buddy of mine said to me one time, you got to remember, Zagger, whether you're catching 100 coyotes or one, you still, that both those guys need the shovel, both need a hammer, both need bait and lure, both need a sifter, both need a kneeling pad, and both need a pack basket. So, so whether you're trapping at this level or this level, you need tools. So all these newer trappers going around still need those really basic fundamental you know items to even set one trap and then it goes from there into traps and those other things so there's a if there's anything good about i shouldn't say it, one of the good things about these newer generations is they're not hung up on the dollars like we talked about earlier they're not hung up on the fur prices and they're trapping regardless and you, you'll see pundits old timers on the internet saying why do you why are you going to go catch 100 raccoons in iowa they're only worth two dollars that's not really any of that guy's business you, you should be happy that a guy's doing it so I do see some outsiders, naysayers saying, why would you do this? But the new the industry will tell you that the guys catching 500 coyotes a year aren't spending a ton of money on equipment at conventions. They have what they need. They, they, my barn's full of it. I got enough for 10 people down there. I don't need anything as far as trapping, you know. So but these new newer guys are buying buying everything. They're buying every trap the guy can make. So I, I, I it gives me a glimmer of hope that the fur thing will stick around. But um, if I wanted to trap for my, the rest of my life, I'd get into I'd get into ADC work, but the challenge with that is we all know, we know all know hunting guides or fishing guides that love to hunt and love to fish, and they decide to turn into business and they turn into miserable SOBs because they're fishing every day, but they're with different guys every day, and then they don't, it, they they're not necessarily that guy that should be the guy. It's a great fisherman doesn't make you a good guide. Yeah, that's a story as old or as business time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. On both ends of that equation. Okay, last question. In all your time in the woods across Ohio, New York, what you've traveled, to, you know, to trap Texas, everywhere else, what's the wildest thing you've come across in the woods? Oh, boy. We're going to find out if Mark Zagger believes in aliens or not right now. No, 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 no. So, um, yeah, there's, the, oh gosh, there's, 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 there's a lot of different things. Um I guess the weirdest thing we ever did was uh, we were trapping on a ranch in Kansas and um, the guy told us we could move into one of his bunkhouses. And uh, when we moved into it, we found out there was a bunch of illegals in it <laughs> that he didn't tell us about or didn't know about. And that was kind of scary because we, we checked in in the dark. And we hear all this mad scrambling and that type of thing. And, and you know, being typical trappers, we're always, you know, especially out in places like Wyoming and Kansas, we're, we're armed. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, what's neat about what's what's really cool about being in the woods all the time is you see things that other people don't get a chance to see. And, I, and I'm amazed. I'm amazed still to this day how trappers tom miranda and i were together this past weekend we were talking about this he always says trappers make the best hunters and and, and when i got into hunting later in life deer hunting and i would tell guys i'm gonna start deer hunting i had several guys that were non-trappers say to me oh gosh you're gonna do great i'm like why because you're a trapper and uh and you guys see things that we don't and and i'll get a picture i'll get a a, a trail camera picture or a, or a video from a deer hunter and say what is this animal running through and i, and I know immediately it's a fisher I, I, and I would think that everybody that hunts 
would know this and uh and they don't and uh what is this a black panther is this a cat what is this you know so um tra- you know there's just so many things that i've probably had a chance to see last year um i have a video that i, I the video would do it better justice but the ice was melting on a, on a stream that i was trapping for beaver and it was coming through a culvert and the ice in the center had started to melt and it had thawed enough that it started spinning so you know how they say if you drop a, a drop of milk into another drop of milk, it's a perfect circle. This there's a perfect circle of ice just going around really slowly, and the water was going around it. I, it's hard to explain, but what was happening was right there in front of me when, when the ice was melting. It was in this perfect eddy of this uh, stream, and this 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 thing was as big as my house. Just this round slow motion thing that you know I can't even explain it. it you'd have to see it. I took video of it to show people, but I, they're like these are the kind of things you see if you're paying attention, if, if you're in the woods a lot. And uh, I always joke about my wife, she hates snakes. So I never see snakes on this property. She sees them every time she walks. Cause she, every step she takes, she's looking for a snake. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm on the fly. I'm looking around like a coyote, you know, I'm not looking at every step, but she sees all the snakes, but I'm kind of that same way when it comes to hunting and trapping, you know, my buddy, Matt Jones said one time, trappers see a track in the mud and they just have to know what that animal looks like that left it. And that, that ongoing, quest for that information or that 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 curiosity and, and that uh, desire to of the unknown is what keeps it all going for all of us and and i'm one of those guys that if someone talks to me for five seconds they know that i drank the kool-aid and um when i started at 77 76 um all the other kids in my class stopped and i kept going and i think because i didn't know at the time but in hindsight these are the things that resonate with me that uh, locked me in for life yeah, that attention to detail is a common denominator when I talk to people, whether it's, you know, Randy Newberg, Fred Eichler, everybody that's been on this podcast is like, if you want to be a better hunter, become a trapper. And it sounds like Tom Miranda had the same notion too. And it's true. It's made me a better hunter um, by that attention to detail. So Mark, first and foremost, I want to thank you. Thank you for coming on. I learned a ton. i am been pumped to chat with you for some time. I'm also excited to know about what you guys are pulling together for Bond. So this is a reminder of people who have made it to the end of this podcast to look at the links in the show notes and go check it out. But Mark, where can people find out more about you and and maybe plug the book you guys did uh, as well as we kind of part on this episode? So I'm I'm old school. Like when I when people want to send me money, they're like, "Do you have Venmo or PayPal?" I'm like, "Dude, I send me a check." And they're like, "I don't have a checkbook." So um, I am on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram or any of those other things. Um, but uh, I also have a I have five or six uh, YouTube videos, a uh, couple podcasts. So you can always reach me through that. Probably the best thing would be Facebook. I don't mind handing out my I have a Coyote U email. It's uh, Mark at Coyote U dot com. Mark at coyote.com. And then uh, I, I'm not that hard to find if someone wants to reach out. And then I have a website for Coyote U that you'll put up as a link, but uh, it's the same deal, www.coyoteu.com. And uh, there's a way to email me through that. So if someone wanted to donate or wanted to talk about Coyote U or just ask me what my favorite trap is, they can reach me um, through those things. Those and then the, and in the book you guys put together through the Flatiron, that's available through New York Trappers, New York State Trappers Association. I'm, I'm glad you said that it is, but believe it or not, we're on Amazon. It's uh, it's it's called New York Trappers, the next generation, and you can buy it on Amazon. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll add that link too. make it easy for people. But yeah. Mark, I appreciate it. It was wonderful to chat with you. And for everybody listening, we'll catch you on another episode of the OKS Trapper podcast. Thanks so much.